koleginica Nataša Bešović, profesorica Engleskog i ja smo danas odlučili da zajednički odradimo jedan javni čas koji u stvari odrađujemo u okviru dana dvojezične gimnazije. Naime, tema koju smo odabrali je tema koja se pominje i iz predmeta engleski jezik, ali i iz predmeta istorija, pa smo smatrali da na ovaj način možemo ostvariti jednu finu korelaciju, a ono što je zanimljivo, kao što sam rekao, jeste da su to upravo učenici dvojezične gimnazije koji su odradili prezentaciju, to je celokupan ovaj čas, takođe u izradi časa se učestvovala i učenica Lana Jovanović iz odljenja prvoka. Takođe, koleganica Nataša, prije nego što počnemo, je htjela da vam se obrati, eto da vam da još par inputa. Tako je, dobar dan i od mene. Želim sve da vas pozdravim. Hvala što prisustujete našem javnom času. Ovo je moj prvi javni čas. Moram pohvaliti odmah sve učenike koji su rado se odazvali pozivu i kolegu, naravno, koji je našao ovu temu i uspostavili smo neku korelaciju, jer to je tema koja nam se prožima kroz učbenik za prvi razred i nešto što je aktuelno. Tako da pustili smo učenike da odrade ovo na njihov način, da vidimo kako su oni to doživjeli. Evo, sada ćemo im dati riječ. Hajde da ih poslušamo. Hello everyone, this is Lana Jovanović, live from Studio 11 from High School Slobodan Škjerović. Today we'll be talking about the current affair issue seen everyone on the social media these days. I will be, it will be an unforgettable trip, I promise. First, I want to call my friend Milica, if she's here. Hello, Milica, can you hear us? Hey, Lana, yes. How are you today? Thanks, I feel great. Can't wait to start, because we will tell you some very interesting stories today. Oh, that's great. But if I remember well, your part was to do some research about life on slave ships, right? Yes, it was Lana and trust me, you wouldn't like to be in their shoes. The horrors of black people's lives started at the beginning of the 18th century, when European merchants were building vessels capable of transporting hundreds of slaves per journey. Twelve and a half million Africans were taken from their homeland and forcibly shipped across the Atlantic. This was a journey that almost two million of them wouldn't survive. The way they were treated was so cruel. Disobedient slaves were tortured and they spent about eight hours a day above deck and later find themselves stuffed in apartments with sleeping as 1.4 meters. They experienced horrors even before reaching the American soil. Yeah, that's, that's so hard to imagine. Could you tell us something more about their lives during the voyage? Of course. Well, before boarding the ships at African port cities, slaves had their clothing and remaining possessions taken away and their heads completely shaved. They were segregated by their adult men in check of affairs, and children were often free to move about the ship. Since slaves were stuffed into narrow compartments, this is like measles, smallpox, and century were rampant. As I said before, disobedient slaves were tortured and beaten, usually with a cat of nine tails. That was a tool designed to inflict maximum pain. Slaves who refused to eat their typical meal of rice and beans were forced to do so sometimes with a speculum oris, a medieval tool used to pry open unwilling mouths. They also tried to fight against the captors, but those rebellions were rarely successful. Their path wasn't easy, and I think that I'm not wrong when I say that they have brought a lot to America, in any sense. And Jovan will tell you more about their influence in economics. Thank you, Milica. You did a good job. Now we are going to see what Jovan has to share with us. Hello, Jovan. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Milica told us about slaves who were imported in America. 
Could you tell us more about the way slavery in America shaped its economy and the country itself? Yeah. Well, the ties between slavery and capitalism in the United States weren't always crystal clear in our history books. For a long time, historians mainly depicted slavery as a regional institution of cruelty in the South, and uh, certainly not the driver of a broader American uh, economic prosperity. Now, contrary to the popular belief, new far, uh, small farmers of New England uh, weren't the only ones that contributed to the uh, economic growth of America as capitalism expanded. Uh, but the hard labor of slaves in places like Alabama, South Carolina and Mississippi must not be forgotten. In fact, almost half of the nation's exports in just six first six decades of the 19th century came from raw cotton, almost all of it grown by slaves. Sorry, sorry I have to interrupt you. Uh, why do you think for so many years historians mean slavery ought to be a southern problem? I didn't seem to make a strong connection between slavery and the North. That is an excellent question, and as you note, quite puzzling. It is puzzling for three reasons. Slave, slavery was a national practice, and while it was mo mostly predominated in the South, uh, then in the North it was re still very important. Second, there was a vast number of economical links between South and North. All the North banned, uh, all the North banned slavery is still very much depend depended on uh, South and slavery. Uh, just think of all these Boston or New York merchants who had to trade with uh, slave-grown goods, or the bankers who financed the expansion of the uh, uh, expansion of the plantation complex. And third, both the abolitionists and the pro-slavery advocates talked over and over about the deep links between the southern slave economy and the national economy. And when we say national economy, we obviously think of the North. So you want to tell us that American economy was busted thanks to African people brought as slaves on American soil, having been treated and traded like animals. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly what I discovered in my research. There were also severe tensions be between spread spreading and the deepening of capitalism and slavery. For one, slavery was quite unstable. Uh, slaves couldn't stand that anymore and they rebelled. So, uh, so owners had to use violent methods, methods to ensure stability of the plantation. So we can say they finally started fighting for themselves because the way they were treating was inhumane. Yeah, that's a terrible thing to hear. But you mentioned that among them were rebels. And if I remember well, you told me a story about a slave. Who was he? Yes, his name was Nat Turner. Now, it is a common fact that sl slaves rebelled many times during your, their long years of suffering. Now, one of them was, of course, Nat Turner. He was a slave who, whose owner taught him how to read. He was intelligent and he was viewed as a prophet by, by other slaves. Now, he was mad because what was happening to his people and him, and he wanted to change it. There, there's also a legend that says that he one, once working on a, a cotton field, he heard a voice or a prophecy saying, him, saying that he's going to be the one to save the black people. And hence the uprising began. Nat Turner had to choose a violent method because there was no other way in that time that he could do it. So, in the period of 24 hours in Southampton County, 55 white people was killed by Nate and his friend slaves. Later that day, Nat Turner and slaves were met with a really organized, re reorganized uh, American military and they suffered heavy casualties. Nat, Nat Turner has gone exiled, but he was soon caught by the American military and brought to justice, brought to justice. Uh, thir 13, Nat and 13 other slaves were executed that day. While, the, while uh, the uprising didn't do much, it terrified the southern states and gave slaves for a hope for a better future without suffering. Thank you, Owen. It's good to know that a voice was starting speaking out. One man who helped in the liberating slaves was Abraham Lincoln. Dragana, hello, are you here? Hi, yes I am. So, if I recall well, your part was to do research about one of the most famous and loved American presidents, Abraham Lincoln. Please tell us more about him. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I must admit that while doing my research, I truly understood why Americans put him on such a high pedestal since he really was an extraordinary person. 
Uh, he was born on February 12, 1809, and he lived all his childhood in poverty. But later in life, he would be known as the 16th president of the United States. He would be leading the country to his greatest moral and political crisis, the American Civil War, and he would be the person to take first steps in abolishing slavery. In um, 1846, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, and 14 years later, he entered the race for presidency. Then, with the background in law and politics, his chances of winning increased. It was a difficult time for the U.S. The South and the North disagreed on a lot of things, including slavery. The North didn't want slaves anymore, while the Southern states did, and Abraham did not support slavery either. He was elected to be president by the Northern states and almost not help from the South. As soon as he became president, the Southern states became seceding from the Union, which uh, roughly translates to them not wanting to be a part of the United States anymore. But Lincoln was determined to keep the country together, and in 1861, a war broke out. It lasted for four years and brought many, many casualties. On January 1st, 1863, Abraham signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That was an order that freed all slaves in the southern states of the America. A few years later, he helped to pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which means they were illegal everywhere in the US. The war ended on April 9th, 1865, and Lincoln was determined to bring the country back together and help the South rebuild. But he didn't live long enough to see that he was uh, assassinated. Assassinated? Why would anyone murder a president who lost his country and people so much? Well, uh, the story goes something like this. Uh, immediately after the Civil War ended, Abraham and his wife um, went to watch a play in Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, and when they were coming back from watching the play, Abraham was shot. Um, and Abraham Lincoln died the next morning on April 15, 1865. He was the first American president to be assassinated. Okay, Raganem, you provided us with a lot of facts today. We talked about fighting for equality, hard lives of black people, economy, but now Nato will describe three major events that shaped the American civil rights movement. Nata, are you there? Yes, hello. It's good to hear you. In my opinion, as you have said, there are many events and many incidents, but I focus on three, which were the most important ones. I would start with sit-ins at lunch counters. So four black college students are refused service and asked to leave a segregated lunch counter at Woolsworth store in Greensboro, but they remain seated. Their passive resistance inspires the movement. Hundreds of students at college campuses began organizing sit-ins after that. Seems to me that a simple light snowflake started an avalanche of events. Yes, that's exactly what it was. The other very important event, which had large influence in process of fighting for rights of African Americans, is the moment when Freedom Riders started protesting segregation. They took interstate buses to South to test integration regulations and protest segregation in bus stations. They faced mobs, riots and beatings at such locations as Birmingham and Montgomery. However, in my opinion, the most significant event in civil rights movement is turning fire hoses on SCLC demonstrators. Birmingham, Alabama's public safety commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor unleashes dogs and uses high power fire hoses against demonstrators from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Many nonviolent protesters were beaten in clashes with police. We are about to see the video, which represents the proof that all African Americans, including a little girl, woman, or old man, no matter of their gender or age, were tortured based on the color of their skin. This video is not for those with easy stomach.
Thank you, Nadja. We know that in that time, women didn't have the right to vote. They were not educated because it was believed that it was their duty to take care of cows, children, husbands. So if white women didn't have the same right as the white men, can you imagine the position of black women? My friend Andre is here today to tell us something that fueled the civil rights movement, and it is, believe it or not, an African-American woman called Rosa Parks. Hello, Andre. I was wondering if you could tell us about the legacy of these fearless women. Well, of course. So Rosa Parks was an American activist in the civil rights movement, and she was best known for, for her pivotal role in the Montgomery bus boycott. Because of this, the United States Congress has called her the first lady of the civil rights and the mother of the freedom movement. Parks' acts of defiance and uh, previously mentioned Montgomery uh, bus boycotts became important symbols of the movement. Uh, she became an international icon of resistance and racial segregation. Uh, she also organized and collaborated with uh, civil rights leaders such as Edgar Nixon, a president of the local branch of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, better known as NAACP, and Martin Luther King Jr., a new minister of Montgomery, who gained international prominence uh, for his involvement in the civil rights movement and went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, sorry, you've said that she became an icon of resistance to racial segregation. Uh, by the way, if anyone of you who are here today doesn't know what it means, it means that uh, black and white people were separated in every part of their public lives. What did she do to become such an important impulse in American civil rights movement, Andre? Well, the event uh, is as follows. Uh, on Tuesday, December 1st, 1955, the 42-year-old Rosa Parks was commuting home from a long day of work at the Montgomery Fair Department store she was going by bus. Black residents of Montgomery often avoided using buses if possible, but nonetheless, 70% or more uh, of typical riders on a day were black. Segregation was written into the law. The front of the Montgomery bus was reserved for white citizens, and the seats behind them were reserved for black citizens. However, it was only by custom that the, black, uh, that the bus driver had the authority to ask a black person to give up a seat to a white rider. The law was interpreted in different ways. Uh, one rule, which was largely ignored, uh, said that no person, white or black, could be asked to give up a seat even if there were no seats on a bus available. Nonetheless, at one point in, on a route, a white man had no seat because all the seats in the designated white section were taken. So the driver told the first four seats in the first row of the colored section to stand, uh, in effort adding another row to the white section. The three others obeyed, but Parks did not. Parks uh, said that people always told her that she was tired and that's why she didn't uh, uh, take up the seat. But uh, she, she told in her autobiography that uh, she was only tired of giving in. Eventually, two police officers approached and stopped the bus addressing the situation and placing Parks in custody. Thank you, Andre. This changed a lot everything we've seen on TV about it, that event. Now, I will call my friend Bojana. Bojana, are you there? Can yes, you hear I'm us? Here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you will tell us something about another black woman whose struggle will never be forgotten. Her legacy is huge. Not only did she fight for equality in education for black people, but for equality in education for all women. Bojana, let's hear what you have to say to us. Thank you, Lana. That was a lovely announcement. And yes, Linda Brown truly is huge. She was born on February 20th in 1943 in Topeka, Kansas, and she is best known for her commitment in establishing equality in education. She herself was a victim of segregation of African-American and Caucasian students in public schools. 
So her parents tried to enroll her in a nearby elementary school, but their application was denied, which meant that Linda was forced to walk across railroad tracks and take a bus to grade school, despite there being a school just four blocks away from her home. This was an initiative for Brown's family to join a group of civil rights lawsuits, which were coordinated and supported by the NACP. This ultimately led to a Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education. At first, the Supreme Court decided that racial segregation was not in itself a violation of the 14 Amendments Equal Protection Clause, as long as the facilities in question were otherwise equal in their quality. The Browns appealed the decision and the court finally established that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Uh, many center politicians tried to overrule the decision and avoid desegregating their school systems. They ultimately failed as the court reaffirmed its ruling in the Browns case and stated that state officials and legislators had absolutely no power to nullify its ruling. This paved the way for integration and was a major victory for the civil rights movement. Yeah, but what happened after that? Uh, well, throughout her life, Linda Brown continued her advocacy in the cause of equal access to education in Kansas. She was a public speaker and education consultant. In 1979, with her own children attending Topeka schools, Brown reopened her case against the Kansas Board of Education, arguing that segregation was still present. The appeals court ruled in her favor in 1993. Linda passed away in March of 2018, and former Kansas Governor Jeff Collier stated that Linda Brown's life reminds us that sometimes the most unlikely people can have an incredible impact, and that by serving our community, we can truly change the world. Yes, thank you, Bajna, a lot. I enjoyed your presentation. Now it's time for one of the most influential people in 20th century, Martin Luther King. As you all know, he was famous for fighting racism in a peaceful way. And you probably know all about him. But, but when I spoke to Ilya, I found out some facts that I didn't know, and maybe you don't know. So Ilya, tell us about it. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Lana. Thanks for the announcement. Um, today, I'll present you some data that you probably haven't heard of, some surprising facts about Martin Luther King's um, I have a dream speech the, uh, he's most, uh, he's famous for that. Um, so, on August 28th, 1963, 250,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. for the historic March on Washington for uh, jobs and freedom. The march rallied Americans to stand up against the continued pol political and social injustices African Americans faced 100 years after emancipation. It took place at a critical moment in the civil rights movement. Tension and racial unrest had been building up throughout the year, and with anti-segregation laws making headlines in Alabama and President John F. Kennedy announcing his intent to pass the civil rights legislation. The timing was right for a massive demonstration. Marshals were trained to ensure order in the crowd due to, concern, due to security concerns, but in the end that wasn't necessary because the marchers chose peace and not violence that sunny Wednesday. Um, the event featured speeches from famous uh, speakers and leaders and musicians such as Mahalia Jackson, Joanne Baez, and uh, Martin Luther King, uh, I bet you didn't know that his I Have a Dream speech wasn't actually prepared. He was the last speaker that afternoon because no one else wanted to speak last, fearing that most news crews would head out by mid-afternoon. So he had agreed to go last and limit his remarks to just four minutes. But that wasn't necessary because the audience gladly stuck around for his 16 minute speech. So you're probably wondering how he came up with, with uh, his speech and uh, Mahalia Jackson called out from behind the podium and said, tell him about the dream, Martin. 
She was referring to a theme Martin had touched upon uh, in a speech two months uh, earlier in Detroit. He honored her request and departed from his prepared remarks and gave his legendary speech we all remember today. Historians believe that the marches and King's speech were important for passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and today, a memorial marks the spot where Martin Luther King Jr. describes his dream of a better America in one of the most influential and memorable speeches in American history. Thank you, Ilya, a lot. Your story was very interesting and powerful. But now, I would also love to invite our history and English teacher to share their knowledge and opinion on a given topic. You probably know a lot about this. I mean, as a historian teacher, this is something that you actually do. But my English teacher, Natasha, is an English, uh, as an English teacher, would you like to ask or to ask something about this too? Yes, of course, I have a problem with my microphone so that there is a bit of delay here. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you today. You worked pretty hard and completed this assignment, paying attention to the most significant details. Yes, of course, I would like to ask you a few questions and I would start with Milica. Hello, Milica. Um, you Excuse told me. us about the life of, of slaves on the slave ships. In your video, I saw a woman, and since today we want to discuss the topic of equality and human rights, I would like to ask you if you could tell me about the position of black women on the slave ships that you've mentioned. How were they treated? Oh, I'm so glad that you've asked. Well, um, I think it's important to emphasize the position of women on the slave ships. So they were usually left unshackled and were unfortunately raped and sexually abused by members of the crew. Uh, sometimes even arriving in the new world, uh, carrying the children of their attackers. But although they were treated like that, they have used their minuscule freedom to often coordinate communities against their captors. In my previous presentation, I've mentioned that those rebellions were very really successful, but still, we have seen in other presentations that black women did matter. I would like to add something to this topic. So um, later on in history, uh, black women didn't only face racism, they faced sexism as well. And in the 1970s, uh, the women's movement was at its peak and uh, the problem with that is that it was only uh, talking about white women's problems, but uh, at the start of the 1980s, uh, actually uh, black women decided to speak up for themselves and to actually fight for the rights they deserve. Uh, I can also say that white women had it really easy compared to black uh, it, in those periods uh, because of that they were more they were respected in the com uh, in the community they were they had more rights but yet they did not have the right to vote because of that they joined uh, the civil rights movement helping the black community get their rights Right. Yeah, that was awesome. And I also wanted to ask something because Yovan's part was pretty interesting to me as a historian. So my question would be to Yovan, do you remember a history lesson that we have been doing this year and it was about the slave uprising in ancient Rome? And according to that, can you make any connection or comparison between these two events, the one in ancient Rome and the one you have discussed about? Yeah, well, I can certainly say that the rebellions or slavery rebellions in America wasn't weren't as large as the ones that happened in the Roman Empire. I can definitely say that the both sides have suffered pretty much the same and both of them had a figure who they they uh, referred to as their hero. And th those figures in the Roman Empire were, of course, Spartacus and here with Nat Turner and other slaves. Now, those figures, uh, if, uh, if in that time they didn't do that much uh, later in generations, they inspired people to fight against the same problems. 
Yeah, so, sorry for interrupting you because I have a question for our teachers. Uh, you, as a historian teacher, probably did some research about this. Is there something you would like to add on that what we said? Yeah, uh, as you have said, both of us previously actually did some research on this topic. So yeah, we actually wanted to reflect on this issue a bit. But what we will focus on is the contribution of African Americans in a great war that shaped the United States as a country. And of course, this is the Revolutionary War. Yes, could you mention that? Uh, to those who do not know, there is information saying that there were about uh, half of a million, million African American who lived in the colonies and only 10% of them were free people, which shows how important the slave trade was for the colonies and their economy. Yeah, not too sure. Yeah, it, actually, it is best shown on the example of Virginia. So the situation got worse with the increase of their number there because, uh, if I recall, in 1690, black people made only about seven percent of the population of Virginia, but whereas only a century later, that number rocketed up to forty percent. But unfortunately, the economical history of Virginia in the 18th century is a history of slaves, and also their struggle to build on their own culture with a little success only in some region. But on the other hand, this was an era when a class of outstanding intellectuals who led the American Revolution emerged. Even though slave trade was of crucial importance to their economy, the Continental Congress decided to ban uh, further importation of slaves, if I recall well. After all, I'm just an English teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, I don't know, uh, do you know that? But at the same time, the governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, he promised freedom to all those slaves who would join the Br British Army. So in the end, the only effect that his proclamation had was pushing many Virginia residents to the side of the Continental Army. Well, speaking of the sides and the war, I found some information which says that the total number, number of black soldiers who served in the Continental Army during this war was somewhere between five and eight thousand. These soldiers who fought under Washington's command and other commanders were members of either black regiments or mixed companies, which means that their leaders were actually white officers and the support of African-American soldiers was immense. Well, I will also shock you with another interesting fact, and that is actually that a certain number of those who signed the Declaration of Independence uh, share different views on the question of slavery. So even John, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who you all have heard of, wrote a whole paragraph in the draft of the Declaration that discussed the attitude towards slavery. Unfortunately, Igor, I bet you know that that paragraph wasn't included in its final version. The things have changed. After all, America evolved found a way to shape the society and Lana, you can take over. After all, you are the presenter. Thank you a lot, teacher. As you can see, we started this discussion with an importation of slaves. Then we spoke about the way slavery shaped African Americans and women and the civil rights movement. Now I would call Xenia to join our discussion and to express her attitude. Hello, Xenia, are you here? Yes, of course. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be a part of the discussion today. As a matter of fact, I came across a survey taken in June uh, 2019, which highlights the gap between the white people see the situation as African, African American and the way and African the way Americans F see themselves in it. Uh, I, I was amazed with the outcome of the survey, which says that six out of 10 African Americans are dissatisfied with the way people of their own race are treated, while there were 32% who are very dissatisfied. It means that only 39 of African Americans nationwide are satisfied, including just 8% of those who are very satisfied. Yeah, does it mean that white American uh, see the situation in a different way than black Americans? Yes. Completely. As a matter of fact, two thirds of white people, which is approximately 60%, are personally satisfied with the way black people are treated, while only 34% are dissatisfied. In short, uh, the majority of white people apparently feel that the treatment of black people in American society today is pretty acceptable, whereas majority of African Americans disagree with this. 
It means that things have changed since the Great March in Washington, but the real question is how much has it changed? For example, there are many famous and influential African Americans today, but even they show dissatisfaction with racism that obviously exists in every corner of modern world. For example, one of my favorite actors, actor, Ansel Washington, uh, said uh, in one interview, in one interview that, that he would never be never paid, paid for the for same, the same main 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 role, role as his white, as his white colleague. colleague. On the other, on the hand, other hand, on February, on February 7, 7, 2002, Halle Berry gave a very emotional Moreover, Americans had their first black president, Barack Obama, which gave the impression that things did change. But in my opinion, it was just an illusion because the flame of racism wasn't extinguished then and now it has exploded as we all know what's been happening in the US lately. In the following footage, you will see the street protest all over America, which was caused by a series of police action against an unarmed African-American. Yeah, and as you have said, it's what affected us all. As through social media, we were able to see what is happening in the United States at the moment. Uh, now, uh, what they also told me while preparing for this presentation was that um, uh, the people, while uh, are, they're doing their jobs around the world, they're showing the display on, of solidarity, right? Because they post their pictures on social media, they talk about this, and I think this is so important to tell me something about that. Yes, Lana, what we have said is totally correct. From Trafalgar Square in London, across Germany and France, all across the way to Syria and Brazil, people are protesting against police brutality in solidarity with the US crowds. They want to show that life of every single person on this world counts a lot. And we must not neglect that fact, and that was one of the main reasons why I decided to cover this topic today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you a lot, and of course we enjoyed it. I want to say that there are no words to describe my uh, gratitude to all of you today. Uh, we all work to make this public class be successful. I want to thank a lot of our teachers because they gave us the opportunity to be the part of this class. And on my behalf and on behalf of all my peers, I want to thank you a lot. Once again, thank you all. This was Lana Ivan from Studio 11 on High School. Okay, thank you, Lana. Thank all of you again. Again, I'm so proud of you. This reminded me of a and cookie I can sell that I really like. And it said, you can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. That's how equality is important and relevant. The aim of today's lesson was not to talk about some bad things, but to learn them, but to learn from them how to become a better person. It means that everyone can help someone in need. Instead of stereotyping people into groups, get a chance to learn more about them before jumping to conclusions. What I want to say is today, everyone can experience some kind of discrimination in any form, in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, physical appearance, religion, national origin, etc. But we can make the world different uh, if we learn from other people's mistakes. That's why I'm so proud of these young people today, of my students, and they didn't distort the truth. They shaped it in their manner, pointing out one of the main problems today in modern society and sending the message of reconciliation and love. After all, that's what teacher teaches them at school to love and to respect each other. If Igor wants uh, to add something, I will gladly let him speak. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. Uh, actually, I would like to add that uh, there were a few hidden messages in their presentation, and not only did you see a struggle of, of a race for their rights, but you probably read between the lines all those messages of sympathy, reconciliation, and hope for the so I do agree with you, Natasha, that this task uh, was very challenging at the moment and it was not an easy topic at all to discuss right now. But I'm also proud of you because you have chosen the path of Mahatma Gandhi and also of Martin Luther King that we have mentioned today. And that is, of course, the path of peace and love. And thank you for that a lot. 
Sa ovim u stvari mi smo i smatrali da naš dio je završen, to je, nadam se prije svega da ste vi uživali, da kažem, u prezentaciji i u pripremi učenika, a takođe samim time smo otvoreni za bilo kakva pitanja, komentare, šta go vi smatrate, naravno, da je možda neophodno kako bi i unaprijedili u krajnjoj liniji ovo što smo danas radili. A naravno, još jednom se i u Natašinu i moje ime zahvaljujem svim učenicima koji su pristovali, to je koji su radili prije svega na ovoj prezentaciji, ali i svima vama koji se naravno prisutovali istoj. Tako je, slažem se. Slobodno možete komentari stati. Mi smo tu. Vanjo, hoću li tebe da prozovem da razbiješ led kao i prethodni put da bi malo možda i ostali? Ali se nadam da ću se ovog puta sjetiti adekvatnih riječi koje su bile. Bilo je sjajno i puno vam hvala na svemu. Sve vrijeme dok ste pričali, nadala sam se da ćete negdje spomenuti to, međutim niste. Nešto što sam ja htjela da podijelim sa vama i nešto što obično govorim i učenicima ili nastavnicima u odnosu na to sa kim radim u obuke o volonterizmu, jeste to da... Jedna od stvari koja je meni bila zanimljiva dok sam proučavala istoriju volonterizma je ta da, naravno osim što ima dugu istoriju, za nastanak volonterizma u nekom skorijem dobu je jako zanimljiva jedna od činjenica, upravo se tiče teme koju ste i vi obrađivali danas, čuveni Underground Railroad, čuli ste znači za verovatno ove tunele, uz pomoć kojih, znači, postojala je mreža volontera koja je u stvari pomagala robovima da pređu sa jedne strane Amerike na drugu, odnosno sa juga na sjever. I to je prosto nešto što sam htjela da podijelim sa vama. Hvala ti, Vanja, hvala ti. Tema je toliko bila inspirativna i toliko široka, a s druge strane toliko catchy da zaista smo morali da pazimo sve što radimo, jer tako je vrijeme kada postoji toliko tih socijalnih nepravdi, moramo udemo ovaj obazrivi. Inače da smo htjeli da pustimo učenike da se onako raspišu i da raspričaju se kao što oni znaju, ovaj čas bi trajao sigurno tri sata. Nadam se da se slažu sa mnom koliko smo samo od njihove prezentacije skraćivali, da dođemo do ovog proizvoda koji je, by the way, bio sjajan. Da, ću samo jače. Previše je materijala. Popravo to sam ja htio da kažem, jer jednostavno i Nataša i ja kada smo eto htjeli i sami da se osvrnemo na određene stvari, pa smo eto izabrali Revolutionary War i tu smo imali nedoumice koliko da skratimo, koliko da vam predočimo informacija, da izdvojimo nebitno od bitnog i sl. Znači i učenici su u tom smislu imali određene nedoumice, tako da naravno ovo je samo da kažem jedna startna pozicija koju smo mi želeli da pokrenemo, a nadamo se da ćemo i mi, a možda i neko drugi imati mogućnost naravno da proširi temu ili da doda upravo kao što si ti rekla neke dodatne stvari vezano za istu. Da li ima još neko da ostavi neki komentar? Ja bih voljela nešto da dodam. Ja sam samo htjela da kažem da mi se baš prezentacije svidjelo i da sam baš ovako ponosna na svoje drugara jer su zaista bili sjajni kao i moji profesori. I htjela sam da dodam da mi je baš drago što se naša škola i moji profesori zalažu za to da minjamo stavove i predrasude društva i da pričamo o ovakvim temama koje su veoma aktualne u svijetu, u našoj maloj državi koja i ne doživljava baš ovakve predrasude. Tako da mi je to vaš mail udržavan. Hvala ti, Vanja. Hvala ti. Naravno, hvala i od mene. Mogu li ja nešto da kažem? Naravno. Naravno, sutra. Kao prvo, meni je mnogo drago i čast mi je što sam bila ovaj dio jedne fantastične prezentacije. Kao Natašina Bina, pivša koleginica i kao njen prijatelj, od nje sam uvijek navigla da ona sve što radi, radi 10 kroz 10. I moram istaći da je prezentacija posebno tema koja je, da kažem tako, oškakljiva i svjedoci smo ovaj što se sve dešava ovih dana po pitanju ovoga što ste vi obradili bila izuzetna. Kao profesor engleskog jezika moram reći da kolega vaš akcenat je sjajan 
da je zaista čast raditi sa ovakvom djecom i šta da kažem, sem citirat ću onu Martinovu čuvenu rečanicu da darkness can't drive out darkness, only light can do it and hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do it. I vi ste zaista pokazali ono što jeste, a to je da je ta mržnja koju, taj rastavljan koji se pokazuje i demonstrira ovih dana, nešto što je stvarno nedopustivo. I ne znam, postoje različite priče, sad pitanja, tako da se izrazim, da li je zapravo sad Amerika zaista kolijevka demokracije o kojoj se toliko priča, a vi kolega ste istoričar, pa sad ja ne bih baš zalazila u taj dio priče jer ja sam samo profesor engleskog, ali moram reći da sam se toliko naježila kad sam gledala sve te jako lijepe priče i te njihove prezentacije i koliko su ta vaša djeca, mislim djeca gimnazije pokazala koliko su ona zaista zrela i ono što je Nataša jako lijepo rekla jeste da mi jesmo nastavnici i osim gradiva koji ih podučavamo u školama, mi ih zaista učimo da treba voljeti sve ljude bez obzira na volju kožu. Svaka čast kolege. Hvala Nataša, hvala.